Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Diversion Stars podcast. All my loyal listeners, thank you for continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Craig Rasmussen boards the Muller ship. He's a writer of odds and ends. Come on board as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Uh, Rasmussen. Thank you so much for coming to the Diversion Stars podcast. So what inspired your love of comics and who are your earliest influences? Um, I would say that I was inspired by comics uh, and my love of comics was created by the exposure to a large comic book collection when I was like 12 or 13 years old, something I, the likes of which I'd never seen, uh, 14 or 15 long boxes full of just massive amounts of continuity in the uh, the heyday of Jim Lee on the X-Men and Todd McFarlane on Spider-Man and uh, just really that big 90s boom uh, that you know transformed an image uh, and that boom. And then I immediately discovered Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns at far too young of an age and was uh, was forever uh, tarnished, we'll say, by that. Uh, and uh, the obsession began because the the level of writing uh, and, and just craftsmanship on that book really blew my mind at a young age. And uh, quickly, I de- got into Matt Wagner's Grendel uh, during the period of Grendel Tales, which I still think is one of the most impressive uh, feats of world building I've seen anywhere uh, a story that spans more than 500 years is pretty impressive to pull off uh, on any count really um and uh you know then i you know f- further down the road fell in love with people like mike mignola and his hellboy of course uh you know al williamson wally wood barry windsor smith mobius richard corbin you know, frank frazetta these are all people that you know over time have really just pushed the envelope for me to show me what's possible and, uh, you know, I also am really impressed by people who make comics now, people who post on Instagram, all the beautiful things they do and all the great comics that are on crowdfunding platforms and on the floors of comic book conventions. There's just an amazing array of talent out there. And I, I just absolutely love the art form. It's so unique. You know, it's just it's untouchable c- comparing it to other things like video games or film. It still holds its own in this high tech era. You know, I do think that crowdfunding has created a golden age of indie comic books. Because it allows basically everyone to contribute. Anyone who can put anything together has a potential to fund it themselves, distribute it themselves. And I think it's a, it's a great time to be indie. It is a great time to be indie. And I've always been obsessed with self-publishing uh, just from watching a few people do it. I mean, even the image boom had a little bit of an effect on that, even though I wouldn't really call that self-publishing. Um, and I, And I, you know... I don't think any of us, any of us really saw this new golden age coming. I I didn't even realize we were in it until we were five years in it. You know, it's like, Mm. oh yeah, the market is, is doing all right. And the pandemic kind of pushed the market over the top and we watched comics explode and sell better than they've sold since the nineties. So it's a very interesting time to be making comics. I I do find it. um, I do like what you mentioned because it it pointed out something that I found myself often arguing with people with online about they're like the death of comics. Like they're they've been at the uh, going up in, uh, considerably over the last ten years. They are consistently moving up every single year, including the pandemic when almost everything else was plummeting. Comic books still had a banner year. They are not going anywhere near mm-hmm. death. <laughs> they're doing just fine. <laughs> uh, so you're a graduate of the Academy of Art University. So what interested you in this school and what did it teach you about the craft? Well, uh, admittedly, I did not graduate, although I did go for five and a half years, uh, but I did part time while I was working full time. So it was a it was a little bit uh, less of an emphasis than I would have preferred. But I think I got quite a lot out of it. And I was really attracted to it because it's a school that's taught by professionals more than it's taught by professors. And I think when you bring people in who are working in their fields, they have a totally different perspective than the academic perspective. Uh, but at the same time, it really emphasizes foundations and you know pushes you through a very rigorous uh, array of studies before you get to work on the thing that you love, before you get to pursue your dream of being an illustrator, an animator, filmmaker, whatever. They really make you work with light and shadow and form and figure. And you know they they really push you to understand the fundamentals. And I think that that is especially in this day and age when everything is so fast and so, you know, automated and, and, you know, sort of inhuman. I think that that's a really, really uh, important approach. And I don't think I even realized how important it was until we kind of are moving into this new era where there's a lot of 
very, very hurried creative work out there where it doesn't seem like people actually, you know, it's okay. It's great to be inspired and to just, you know, put, put out whatever it is that you're dreaming of in your mind. That's amazing. And it's, it's one of the great things about being a human being is that we can take and translate this, you know, information that's in our, in our noodles, as it were, you know, our bowl of noodles, and then put it down on paper or put it on screen or whatever. And, and it's, it's easier than it is than ever to do that. But I do think that fundamentals are being a little bit um, left behind sometimes, you know, and, and once I was in that level of study for a while, it took me a while to really appreciate it. Cause I was like, man, I just want to draw comics. Like I just, I just want to do pen and ink and draw comics. Like I want to have to draw all these, you know, all these models and do all this sculpting and stuff. But I mean, in the long run, it's had a hugely positive impact on my work and it's a toolbox that I constantly refer to. Like I, I'm shocked at how much I actually go back to the information that I learned in the first few years of going to school there. So I think it's an impressive school. Uh, like many art schools, I don't think that it emphasizes business enough. So that would definitely be my one complaint about it. Not that you asked, but I think that, you know, they, they among many other art schools are kind of getting nailed for that because they're not, they're not creating, you know, people that are able to jump right into a job all the time. Um, but at the same time, you know, those foundations, the fundamentals, uh, foundations is what it's called there, that stuff really serves you well when you're trying to figure out the business. So I don't know. That's just a tangent that my brain brain always goes to as, as soon as I start talking about the school. No, I, I will say I you you literally um, guessed my next question, which was what do you wish the school had taught you? So thank you for answering that already. Yeah, um, you're welcome, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> why do what do you think is the importance of business for art? And why do you think the business and art are so important together for an artist to be successful? Well, because artists are typically obsessed with what we do and we don't really want to do anything else. Once we get going on a jag or, you know, get in the zone of something, it's really, really hard to deviate. And I think in this day and age, especially, it is incredibly difficult to make money off of art. It's always been difficult to make money off of art. However, there are, there are more avenues to make money off of art now than ever before. So understanding business and being able to kind of crack that egg and, and go in the directions you need to go to find those avenues to make money are very important. And I think that, you know, trying to find ways to emphasize the understanding of business without looking at it like selling out or commoditizing your art, mm. you know, or, or undermining your creativity. I mean, these are all myths that a lot of artists live under. And I, I think that it's important to dispel those myths as much as you can and, you know, maybe I'm a little bit more obsessed in the business, you know, uh, department than a lot of other artists are. I come from kind of a corporate family. So, you know, my mom has been a CEO and a president, vice president of all this, these, you know, commerce companies, basically this like upper level business, you know, that it's uh, my, my brain cannot wrap around that stuff at all. I can't understand, uh, you know, the cubicle life or bureaucracy very well. It, it's very difficult for me to wrap my brain around that. However, I don't really think that that is what business is. Business is really just an exchange, you know, it's an exchange of energy when you come down mm. to it, you know. Um, but as far as making art, if you want to keep making art, you have to understand business. You have to, because you're going to just end up being sidelined and having to do something else to make money. And then, you know, your art becomes a hobby and and nobody wants to be a hobbyist with the thing they've loved the most, you know what right. I mean? So for me, it just kind of pushes that obsession. And every time I, I move away from the business side of it for six months or whatever, and I realize, hey, you know, I'm not really like thinking about the business side of things. My mind is not on my money and my money is not on my mind as, as the, the lyric goes, you know? Uh, so it's, it, it's important, I think, to survive as an artist, if you really want to keep going. I mean, it's great to have it as a, as a love and as a pursuit that you do on the side. That's amazing. If you, if you are in a position where you can do that, more power to you, but I've never had a job that really left me with the energy that I needed to really do the art the way I wanted mm. to. So for me, figuring out the ins and outs of self-publishing on a daily level is super important. It just, it just reinforces its own importance all the time. You know? So as, as you're talking about um, the, the school as well, in other, words, in other words, they had it, you said they call it foundations, certain aspects mm -hmm. of the work. Are you able to tell when an artist doesn't have those foundations in their own work? And what does it provide for you? And that has made your art unique, special, or better than what it could have been. 
I think it's actually painfully obvious when somebody doesn't have uh, that those elements in their work. Um, you know, we're talking about anatomy. We're talking about lighting. You know, we're talking about color theory. You know, form like like the breaking things down into their basic simplest forms mm. in order to be able to show them perspective. Perspective is a big one in comics. People are are deathly afraid of backgrounds because perspective seems like this you know math based you know, a quagmire of information that doesn't really have anything to do with visuals. But in fact, it, it if you understand perspective, it pushes your visuals well beyond what they would be without it and yeah. makes for very dynamic compositions. Composition is another one of the foundations. You know, it's like just understanding the picture plane and the center of interest and, and you know, again, lighting. These things all push the drama of your work. And the, that's the toolbox that I refer to you know, that I am referring to when I say I refer to my toolbox of foundations, because these are the things that that for me, you know, my art is never as good as I want it to be ever. I'm always constantly like, how much more can I push this? Even when I turn in a piece, like the piece I stayed up all night last night to turn in this morning to a publisher, I'm just like, man, I just wish I had like another day so I could have pushed that further, you know, and, and I'm constantly stepping back and looking at it like, well, did I you know, did I push the lighting far enough? Did I push the composition far enough? Is it dynamic enough? Is, is there enough impact? <clears throat> and these are things that, you know, they just beat into your head over and over when you're doing the fundamentals at a school like that. So I unfortunately think it is it is really hard um, to be a long-term creator without those things. And, and if you look at who the most powerful creators are in comics, and, you know, I'm I'm old guy, so I refer to people like Mike Mignola or whatever, who are not necessarily like he's current, but I mean, at the same time, like his, his peak of his his fame, you know, and and his and his level of output that that is probably past. You know what I mean? Like he's 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 in his 60s now. He doesn't really care to to hustle the way the young artists have to hustle. But if you look at his work, it's deceptively simple. And you realize mm -hmm. the more you study it, that it is incredibly design based. The guy absolutely he, he will fully tell you he hates to draw complicated stuff, but he found a way to represent complicated stuff by breaking it down through design fundamentals. And he, he has created a very, very unique look for his work that I don't really think would have existed if he didn't understand visuals the way he does, you know? And so, so, so as an artist, how long has it taken you to try to find your voice, your style, like Mignola event, eventually got his, how long has it taken you to find yours? Well, <clears throat> I really feel like my my creative confidence is something that I am I'm frankly just getting into to where I am getting very comfortable with my own work. Mm. Um, but I will say that my voice has been there a lot longer than I was able to recognize it. Um, you know, I don't have the same the same kind of style that can crystallize the way that <clears throat> Mignola can crystallize his, or or maybe a, a more cartoony artist can uh, crystallize theirs, because there's a system for that work that's a little bit uh, more cut and dry. I'm not saying the results are cut and dry at all. I'm just saying that there there's a way that you can create a shorthand. And, and like those, those, you know, like how to, how to cartoon books, those Lee J. Ames books, like how to draw things that you see in libraries, those, those, you know, very simple books that break things down into like circle, you know, oval, you know, line through the middle, line through the middle, like, you know, drawn top, like all that stuff is, is fundamentals, of course, but if you keep it at a really simple level, it becomes so systematic that it's very, very easy to recognize and pull off. And I don't think that I was able to do that for my own work for a very long time. I'm not even sure I'd do it now. I think it's in a way, it's just like a an inherent style. I don't even know, you know, until recently, I didn't even know what my style was. And I think <clears throat> it's not to say that it wasn't there. It's just for me, the thing that helped me to see it was actually getting it out in front of people. And that was the biggest drawback from my own career personally is that I don't think I spent enough time putting my work out there and getting the feedback of people who are who just immediately you know say hey are you a fan of Wally Wood you know you really seem to love retro science fiction and it's like I didn't even realize I was making the turn into retro science fiction when it happened I just it just happened and I'm a huge love of, I have a huge love of science fiction as I'm assuming you do based on the title of your podcast yes uh you know so there's a there's a hefty you know influence of all of these different 
elements there and all these different IP from decades of consumption. You know, I'm a huge fan of watching and reading and things like that. So, you know, a lot of this stuff had to crystallize. So that's a very long winded way of saying I didn't know that I had a style, but I did have a style the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so what inspired the creation of odds and ends and how long did it take to complete? Well, right now I'm actually in the process of completing it because the way that I am treating it is I am revamping a previous publication. And by revamping, I mean, I actually found a way to turn a 100 page book pictured right here uh, into a 200 page book Um, because I wanted to print another edition after I printed 50 copies of the first edition for San Diego in 2017. So here's that right there. It's my final copy. It's why the spine is all beat up and there's, you know, literally a page falling out. Um, But when I, when I previously published it, um, I don't know how much I can show because it's kind of falling apart, but there were some penciled pages in there. The pages are very complete. They're completely lettered, you know, and when I just change the levels in Photoshop, they're totally readable. Um, but when I went to do a new edition of the book, I decided that I didn't want any more pencil in it. I didn't think that it was fair, especially crowdfunding a book. I didn't think it was fair to tell people to, you know, back my project and then give them a bunch of pencil artwork. Um <clears throat> Definitely, I could do something in you know Photoshop or on the iPad to to boost those pencils or whatever. But I have decided to go back and ink older pencils, which has been a very interesting process, and uh, I'm still in the middle of that. Um, so that's why there's actually a delivery date of June or August. Um, <clears throat> but that's turning into a really exciting thing for me personally because the character featured on the cover there's a time travel character, and I included 11 pages of his story in the original edition in pencil. And while I think it's very complete, um, it occurred to me that I actually had enough to put the entire first issue into the new volumes. So I'm inking the whole issue. I'm actually more than halfway done inking the full issue of that. And then uh, I've got a handful of inks uh, beyond that. So it should be done in the next couple of months at the most. Um, it's, It's been a really arduous process, especially with other deadlines on the desk at the same time. But it's it's kind of exciting and, and going back to what I was saying about not realizing that my my creative voice was there all along, it's helping me to see that it was there all along. And there's a lot of elements that I'm personally a little bit impressed by, you know, my younger self where I'm kind of like, man, you know, that guy gets it. <laughs> it's, sort of, it's funny when it's yourself and you realize like, oh yeah, you know, maybe I'm not a complete idiot, you know, maybe I do have my, my shit together a little bit more than I thought, you know. Um, so that's making it kind of fun to, to shape out the older work, uh, because it's got more going for it than I was able to see at the time. And by, you know, giving it a little bit of new polish and don't, don't be mistaken. I am definitely erasing some hands and, you know, changing some anatomy that was, you know, just not quite there. Um, but trying to keep the spirit of each story. So yeah, it's, it's been a really interesting process and and it is not yet complete, but it's getting there. I think it's going to be exciting. Now, one interesting thing that I find fascinating about the um, the comic book is that you described it as your roadmap to demonstrate how you got where you are now. That that was in the summary in which I read, so I'm repeating it. Um, and so how did you select which works uh, would enter the book? And are the specific works examples of a specific style, stage, or milestone in your artistic career? Well, most of them are science fiction. There are a couple of, uh, you know, little odds uh, and ends of humor, if you will. Um, but mostly to me, it was it was whatever was the it was whatever was the most complete and whatever, whatever told the best story, you know, there, are, there are definitely dozens and well, probably a couple hundred pages of my older work that I left out. Um, but the, the 200 pages that are included all have something going for them. They all have <clears throat> a, like a, excuse me, they all have a unique uh, presentation, storytelling style, story concept, Um, but they're all complete and clear as far as the story is concerned. So that was my, like my fundamental, uh, benchmark for anything that was going to be included. It had to be a certain level of quality, but that quality wasn't just visual quality. It was story quality. So that answers your question. I gave you a short answer this time. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, several of the stories, um, that I read, they have, um, introductions. Some of them mentioned release dates and in progress. Are these stories in their final versions and which stories will be released in fuller versions? Um, The only thing that will be released in consecutive versions, uh, there's two. Uh, There's a King David story that I did as a a TV pitch um, 
in 2014, almost 10 years ago, which blew my mind when I figured that out the other day, talking to the writer. Um, that has new life uh, at Gold Key Comics. Gold Key is an older publisher that is reviving its brand after being in mothballs for over a decade. Um, actually, maybe 20 years. I'm not sure because Valiant actually bought most of the Gold Key characters for the 90s version of Valiant. That's where a lot of those characters came from. Um, but uh, as Gold Key is looking to beef up the library of upcoming titles, uh, they they were pretty impressed by this book. And I, I've always been you know, very proud of the King David. It's called Kingdom of David. And I've been very proud of that project for a long time. And it's just one of those things I did for a TV pitch. The TV pitch never happened because there was another King David show that got greenlit at the same time that we were literally putting the color and the letters into our pitch. And so I was kind of like, sad clown horn time i think and uh it just ended up on a shelf you know uh so that's going to end up probably coming out in 2024 beginning of uh like at the end of 2024 it will begin um how i've been discussing with the writer how many issues it's actually going to be it looks like it's going to be three uh limited series of like four issues each so that'll have new life starting in 2024 sometime um, but the other thing is the the Adventures of Dr. Cotton Hickox, my time traveler. Uh, that is, like I said, I'm putting the full first issue into uh, the second volume of this two volume set. And that is something I'm going to pursue pretty avidly. I've got, uh, obviously, I've got other projects. I've got Technopolis and Sojourners here behind me. Um, you can see it there if I move my mic. Um, <clears throat> Those are my two kind of current titles, if you will. And I have graphic novel editions coming of both of those, which will be the first book in a two or three book series for each. Um, but at the same time, I basically have two flagship characters. I have the character from Technopolis here, Raymond Bradbury Seeger is his name. Um, his uh, his father is a science fiction nerd. And then Dr. Cotton Hickox. Uh, Dr. Cotton Hickox is one of the oldest characters I have that I created. and And so he is in a way you know, the main character, if you will, of my universe of connected stories. But um, the way that that book has been coming together has been a really weird experience, partially because I created in like 2000, I came up with the story, but I was not ready to draw the story. And then once I started to get a little more ready to draw the story, I realized I might not be ready to write the story. <laughs> so it took a long time to shape that out <clears throat> and to find the confidence I think in my abilities on both levels to put that story together. And so that's why I sort of found myself with the first issue in hand. It was, it was almost an accident when I realized, Oh my God, there's 24 pages there, you know, um, because it's, it's a bigger story. And I, I really wanted this main story of that character to be self-contained, but I have all these other ideas for him to have these zany misadventures through time. So what I've decided to do, and I've already drawn the first of these, uh, is that there's the adventures of Dr. Cotton Hickox, but there's also the misadventures of Dr. Cotton Hickox. And so the misadventures of Dr. Cotton Hickox is a, is a maxi series, if you will. It's probably going to be around 10 books um, and they will be normal ish comic book length. And uh, whereas the, the adventures of Dr. Cotton, Hick uh, the adventures of Dr. Cotton Hickox, see, I came up with a name. That's a mouthful for me to say, so <laughs> don't feel so bad. Um, but, uh, but that, that will be like a, a graphic novel. I'm kind of thinking of that as like a one self-contained story. It's got like a three to five act arc. And when it's, when it's done, it's done. And the misadventures can continue after that too, because the whole idea behind the story is that <clears throat> the very first time he travels through time, it scrambles his brain. So he forgets who he is. He forgets where he's from. He kind of forgets how to do stuff. He still remembers how to do some stuff. So he can still function, you know. Um, and I'm I'm a I'm a big martial arts fan. I do martial arts myself. So he he remembers how to how to fight and how to protect himself, but he cannot for the life of him remember who he is. And so he actually chooses the name of Cotton Hickox from random items that he sees during one of his misadventures. He doesn't remember his name, but somebody is grilling him for what is your name? Who are you? And so he just like sees random signs and he just like picks a name or whatever. And that's why he's got kind of a crazy name. Um, and the whole idea of the main story is that he's trying to figure out who he is and, and why he can't remember who he is. And it has something to do with his evil twin, which is not so much as a, um, a multiverse story, even though it is a multiverse story, if you will. 
I did it a long time before the the fad. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's it's like the mirror universe, the Star the Star Trek mirror universe, or or uh, you know Michael Knight's evil twin from Knight Rider. You know, it's like give him a mustache or a scar on his face. You got to like do a thing to make it the uh, the evil opposite. And that was I was always obsessed with the evil opposite more than I was obsessed with the multiverse element. Although in the misadventures, I am going to play with the multiverse thing a little bit more. Um, but it's all about the clash of the dark and light in the main story and the, there's a specific reason that he can't remember who he is and that's and I'll, I'll give it away which is that essentially they're kind of sharing space the evil and good version of him are sort of sharing space and time like they, they do something energetically through this process of time travel that sort of it's creating like a mental feedback problem if you will. And that's why he can't remember who he is. It's like blank. It's creating a blank spot in his own mind. And so that's what the main story is about where he's trying to, to break through that and trying to, you know, get out of that situation. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited about that. You can probably see why I couldn't, I wasn't sure if I could write that. I was like, can I pull this off? This is really complicated, <laughs> um, you know, but I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. And, and over time I've been, I've managed to shape it and I've come up with some cool ideas and, you know, we'll see where it goes. I'm, I'm really excited to draw that story, but um, I may not draw the rest of the graphic novel until I put out at least a couple of the misadventures or maybe I'll just work on it kind of simultaneously. But I, I drew at the beginning of 2022, I drew when I drew the first misadventure. I did it in a sketchbook, which is really dumb. So now I have to transfer it over and do all this stuff to make it, make it bigger and better. And I don't know why I drew it in a sketchbook. It's the, like I have friends who've drawn comics and sketchbooks before and they've been fine with it, but I just felt like I needed to transfer it to bigger paper and kind of give it the give it the glory that it deserves. Mm -hmm. um, but that one is a really crazy story. I'm really proud of that. It's a really fun action adventure comic, and it is so wild. Like that's the thing about this character is it's 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 pretty wild. Like even this first issue that I'm including in odds and ends, it has at least five timelines in just the first 24 pages. And it bounces around, but not in a way that's confusing. It bounces. Uh, it's well, it's confusing on purpose, but you can follow it. You can follow the thread. You can kind of get it like by the end of the first issue, like the last three pages are a bit of a cliffhanger. And I think that once that cliffhanger hits, it's clear what I'm doing with the timelines. So I'm sorry to go down such a tangent. I don't even know <laughs> if I answered your question. <laughs> so, so when you're dealing with something that's that level of crazy, when or how much do you think you got to rein yourself in a little bit? How much do you figure it's best just to let loose and see what happens? Like, is there <clears throat> is there a tightrope there where you got to figure out how much into the crazy you can lean in and how much you need to like rein back? I think that my problem with that concept is that I wasn't leaning into the crazy enough. And the best elements of the story that I've created so far are the craziest. And <clears throat> going back through and realizing that I, I believe that I am ready to do this as a project was only possible because I was started to go through my thumbnails and like, I was looking at these scenes that I had thumbnailed and written. And I'm like, these are nuts. Why did I not draw these? They're so fun. Like there's so many crazy visuals, you know, people's brains popping on top of their heads, but like in a cartoony way, cause it's not real. It's not, it's not gore. It's not body horror. It's, it's like cartooning even though I'm kind of drawing it more at like a fine art level, you know, I, I just, I'm really excited about doing that stuff. I think the crazy is, is the most welcome element for me because it makes it fun to draw. Mm. It's less rote, you know, it's less just normal drawing. It's less, you know, I, I like that my style is tending towards a retro realistic style, but I also am having so much fun with this insane cartoony, you know, uh, concept for this overall story like it's just really pushing me in creative directions that i don't think i would normally go and uh i kind of as a writer i kind of think of grant morrison as my patron saint if you will i'm not saying he's the best comic book writer but i just think that the way that he writes seems to match my imagination really well and there's a lot of stories of, i love the invisibles and i love we three he's written i love all-star superman he's, he's done a handful of stories that are just so well crafted and so bizarre, the nameless, another great one that he did. He just can take it to that 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 metaphysical level that is just so out there that it becomes very exciting to see on paper, you know. And so that's kind of where I want this to go. If that you answers know, your question. What, what I think is fantastic about that, like I said, you have this crazy story. Then on the other side, you have Kingdom of David, which again is very much not, at least from from what I've read. It it is it, is a definite demonstration of range of story. 
that is not present, I think, in a lot of art, artists and writers, because once again, usually you find your niche that you're comfortable in and you just run with it. But it mm-hmm. definitely sounds like you're trying to do with like, on the one hand, when you're know, crazy mood, you got this story. On the other side, you have your Kingdom of David, which is like I said, a little more straight. Um, so it, the, and the cool thing about Kingdom of David too is the artwork on that is absolutely beautiful. It, it, it's Thank a you. beautifully done uh, comic book. Um, how important was it for, in, in your opinion, for people to see the character of David as a fully realized human and not this biblical interpretation. Very important. That was actually the chief inspiration for Kingdom of David. It is the thing that Scott Rickles and I, the writer, he and I talk about that all the time, to not present it as a biblical myth. We're trying to look at the historical David. Obviously, we love swords and sandals and we love, you know, mysticism. We, we both agreed that like going the Conan direction is a much cooler way to take something like that than to try and do Joe Kubert's Bible, which is all kind of on a mytho- mythological level. And that's Joe Kubert's Bible is an incredible piece of comic book art. I mean, it is such a cool thing to look at that somebody went to those biblical stories and found a way to interpret them into comics because comics in a way they, they play on that level already. So it's not impossible to imagine that you can easily create some sort of mythological, you know, uh, world through those those existing tales that we all grew up with, whether you're religious or not, you're you. It's impossible to escape biblical tales, right? Um, but treating it more swords and sandals and blood and guts to me, that was I, immediately the lights started going off in my mind. I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is gonna be fun to draw. There's gonna be pu- puddles of blood all over the place. You know, we have dismemberments in the first 15 pages. There's all kinds of this like horrifying stuff, but that's so much more realistic. <laughs> then you then anybody really wants to admit honestly i mean <laughs> like i can't stand guns but i'm kind of glad we don't live in a time where people all have swords on their hips anymore because that's even <laughs> even more violent and gorier than guns so you know it's uh it's an interesting thing to to craft and i'm really looking forward to going back and you know shaping the character of david because if you look at king david he is a very very interesting example of the rise of a hero and then the fall of a ruler and there's a lot of stuff in between too. I mean, he is very much a man. He's very much given to temptation and all that stuff is in the Bible, but a lot of it is just the teeny tiniest mention of mm-hmm. certain things. And there are, there's just all of this politics in the Jewish kingdoms. I mean, the kingdom of Judah split into two kingdoms with two kings during his reign. So there's all kinds of stuff that's really interesting to play with as far as just it's almost like star wars where it's just this huge story about but it's also kind of on this small personal level with this one guy and so tracing it from you know him just being a shepherd boy kind of stumbling into becoming a ruler and then you know kind of fucking that up is it's a really it's a really tantalizing thing to be a creator on i think you know it's just that i can't really get enough of it i'm super excited to do more so, and I think the interesting thing about David is that once again, he's a very much a biblical icon. When people talk about it, whether you're, you know, someone who's read the Bible or someone who's just kind of familiar with it, he's one of those characters that people just tend to know of. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you're writing a character or his character, what do you think is the aspect of his character and his story that people most often misunderstand about it? I think that there's a, a magic quality to him being, you know, the small boy who slew the giant. And I think that we're we're kind of trying to dispel that. And that'll still be there in a metaphor on a metaphorical level. The scene is still gonna exist. I, I don't know exactly how we're gonna do the Goliath element of the story, but but that will be one of the smallest elements of the actual finished product. You know, like we're not gonna it's not about David and Goliath, you know, and this that might be the biggest misconception. Um, because the, I mean, the, the trial of David and his love for Bathsheba, which was adultery is as, as big, it has, it has as big of an emphasis in the Bible as him fighting Goliath. And you never hear people talk about that like ever. So it's, uh, to me, we're making it more human, I think. And we're just trying to get, look, the metaphor of, you know, the, the tiny, defeating the big is is an amazing metaphor and everybody can can benefit from that at some point in their life i'm sure but it's also not the only thing you know it's like me me being a comic book artist is not the only thing that defines me as a as a person and if i was distilled down to just being this dude who draws you know 50 years from now i think we could do better describing me as a person you know what i mean so i think that's kind of how we're looking at david as a character we just we really want to show the complexity 
works. We really, we really want to show the lost innocence, I think, which that sounds kind of shitty as far as like the icon of, you know, David who slew Goliath. Like that's, he, that puts him on such a pedestal. And to me, I just want to take a sledgehammer to that pedestal. So, so, so you were, when you're working on something of that level of religious importance, is there a level of risk involved in doing that with someone like him? Uh, maybe. I mean, I'm not particularly religious. I was raised Christian, but I am not religious um, on purpose, I will say. Um, mostly, you know, I don't want to get into that. I'm not going to get into details on that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's dangerous. It's more dangerous than doing a King David book. That's for sure. Is talking about religious feelings on a podcast. Um, <laughs> but uh yeah, no, there's some risk. I think. I think we're, but we're. I think we're trying to do it justice. I think. I think more than the religious side of it. I think what we're trying to do is is tell a piece of Jewish history and do that justice. I think that is more important and more vital, and and long term, I think that will uh, have some staying power, as opposed to trying to be pious artificially in some way. I'm not. I'm not really into that. You know. I think. I want to tell a great story. I want to show a piece of history. History is a fascinating place. It's, it's, I mean, one of the reasons that I like history as much as I like science fiction is because they're kind of the same thing as a creative person. You know, you go into a world that is completely unfamiliar and you can hold it up as a mirror to our own time so easily. And it's those, two, you know, you have to learn to draw a whole nother visual flavor. It's really kind of the same thing, you know? And I didn't realize that until I, I don't know until the last five or six years that it's basically exactly no there's no there's no surprise in my mind that i'm a huge history nerd as much as i am a science fiction nerd mm. you know so i'm just trying to honor that i think and you know we'll go from there and we'll see what happens i, I have no idea i mean so far i mean i've had some really really solid feedback and responses from fairly religious people on kingdom of david like nobody's been offended by our approach so far um i think that one of the biggest dangers might be that we are not treating Judaism or Christianity the way that modern minds treat them. I think what we're trying to say is that back in the dusts of history, it was mysticism, you know, like it's just, it's just, there's straight up Jewish mystical rituals or sacrifice, all kinds of stuff that we don't really want to acknowledge these days, but that's how time was that's how the time was back then you know there's it's that's why conan is a great kind of springboard i think as far mm -hmm. as like how to treat it you know it it i don't know mysticism to me is it's just so much more interesting than couching something in religion you know capital r religion you know and and and, and mysticism did, mysticism didn't even become little r religion until some time had passed you know so mm. we're just trying to kind of treat it that way well, like I said, I got a chance to read it. It's a fantastic story. I really enjoyed it. Um, so when and where can our listeners find Odds and Ends? So Odds and Ends is currently funding on Zoop, the crowdfunding platform for comics only. Um, it's zoop.gg slash c slash odds and ends. I'm sure you can find uh, the link in the show notes. You can find the link in my uh, Instagram profile at Craig Comics, K-R-A-I-G-C-O-M-X. Um, and, you know, the campaign's doing pretty well. But I'd love to get a lot more people on at the very end. We have about a week to go at the time of this recording. And, uh, you know, after that, um, I don't really know how many extra copies I'm going to print. So you can definitely find some copies through me at conventions late 2023. So um, possibly Tucson Comic Con and and uh, whatever, New York Comic Con, maybe Emerald City. Maybe it sort of depends on when I actually get the print done and if we can get them delivered before august then they'll then i'll be able to show up to conventions in august with uh some books but i think the best way to get it is to go to zoop right now um because i just truly do not know how many extra copies i'm gonna have on hand i'm, I'm maybe i'm only gonna have like 20 or 30 extra copies at the most and as far as convention sales those are gonna be gone by mm. you know by thanksgiving so um, I, I would like to say that I'm going to print more and more and more of these. We'll just see how it goes as far as the, the sales are concerned once the book is actually in the production process after the campaign is over. All right, sir. Thank you. Listen, thank you so much for talking with me. Uh, I hope my listeners check it out on Zoop. Um, if you send me over the link, I will attach it to the notes so hopefully people can find it and pleasure the hell out of it. So I want to thank you so much, sir. You've been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate the conversation. You too. Take care.